Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Happy Hour Live webcast from WhiskeyCast.com. I'm Mark Gillespie in the WhiskeyCast studio in New Jersey. Hope you've had a good week. Uh, we're going to have some fun over the next 45 minutes to an hour or so because Easter is coming up and Easter and chocolate go together about as well as, well, well chocolate and whiskey, chocolate and anything. And so I have a bunch of chocolates here that uh, came courtesy of our guest, Rachel McCormick, and uh, the kind folks at CocoaRunners.com. Rachel, of course, is an ILO-based whiskey educator, but you also do a lot of stuff with chocolates too, right, Rachel? Yes, I do. I'm not I'm not based on ILO. I'm, not, I'm just I'm based on the mainland of Scotland. My, uh, I stand corrected. I, no, it's no problem at all. I would love to be based on ILO, but I have to live somewhere nearer to a bit, few more shops and a bit more of a city. Um, I wrote a book called Chasing the Dram, which was about going around Scotland, uh, mostly drinking in distilleries and then writing about about learning about the whiskey in distilleries. So it was a really hard, terrible uh, job to do, going around Scotland, drinking in distilleries and then writing about it. And then recently I've started this project working with Coco Runners to try and get um, whiskey people, people who really like whiskey, which is all of you, uh, to get them into craft chocolate because I think there's something really uh, that whiskey and craft chocolate have in common and I think whiskey drinkers are kind of missing a trick that they could really do with getting themselves into craft chocolate. Now I've always thought that whiskey worked well with regular chocolate not the craft chocolate but I I'm just going to come right out and admit it my secret love is Cadbury's dairy milk the good UK ones, not the crappy ones they make over here in the US under license, but the good dairy milk bars from the UK that uh, I get when I go to the UK and Ireland last week. And I'll admit I brought a couple home in my bag from Ireland last week. But what is so the difference know, between... Go ahead. So you know how when you were very young and you thought that really cheap vodka was the best thing in the world to drink? I never thought that, but okay, I'll well, get your. Was, so, so what was what was your entry level? What was the very first thing that you drank that you thought, oh, I'm the bee's knees, I can drink this, and actually you wouldn't drink it anymore ever. Um, probably some rum. You used to. It was a was it bad rum that you used to drink when you were younger? Yeah, it was a young. bad rum that I started out on when I was just turning twenty one. I got some bad rum. So this is like dairy milk is like so bad dairy rum. Milk, Dairy milk is kind of like bad rum compared to really, really good top quality rum or really good whiskey. That's, you know, that to me would be would be the difference. The thing about about craft chocolate is that it's kind of the total diametric. It's exactly. Dairy milk is not top tier chocolate spirit bomb. I agree with you. You're about to see what is top tier chocolate. So the difference between kind of commodity chocolate, these things are made... These things are made like in a in a you kind of massive factory. They've got lots of different ingredients. They're made the the cocoa that they that they buy in. There's no you know, there's no really thought or care given into actually the varieties of cocoa, the type of bean, the taste of the bean. And the craft chocolate makers they buy very direct directly from very specific farms, and they're given the farms are given normally between three to ten times more amount of money they normally get for producing cocoa, which means that they can do it properly, they can feed their children, they can educate their children. And these small companies, they buy they buy the beans and they roast the beans themselves and they temper the beans themselves and then they add on add any ingredients, which is normally just sugar and possibly some I think you've got one chocolate that you're having which has got some other ingredients in it, but not very many. They're very obvious. And these small producers then make these chocolates and they like sea salt or chocolate milk, and they and they sell them uh, on the market. So what Coco Runners does, Coco Runners buys in uh, craft chocolate from around the world, and they sell it online in their online shop. Now, one of the things Coco Runners is the biggest craft chocolate seller in the whole world. If you look, if you compare it to whiskey sellers in the UK, I would probably see it's like the it's like the it's like the chocolate equivalent of the whiskey exchange, which is the biggest online shop of whiskey in the world. The thing with Coco Runners, though, they have three employees. So, and, and you know, and, uh, the whiskey exchange is a lot more than three employees. And also you can get whiskey in a lot more places than just the whiskey exchange. 
So the, the craft chocolate industry is much, much smaller. Um, and I think that it, it's a really good, it would just be a really good thing, I think, for whiskey drinkers to get into craft chocolate. Now, someone there said that they were worried about their bank account. They were like, oh my God, this is all I need, another craft chop, another craft thing to get into. I can tell you, it's a lot cheaper than good whiskey. When you can pay £100,000 or like $150,000 for the very top range of, of, of whiskey that you can find to invest in, a craft chocolate bar is not something you would invest in. The most expensive one, I think, that Coco Runners has is about £10, which is maybe $12 or $13. So, you know, it's, it's a luxury product, but it's a much cheaper luxury product than whiskey. That's grumpy gripes about everything. <laughs> and our pal Chris Ratcliffe points out that when you start getting into single estate chocolates, the complexity and flavors are astonishing. The Rabot estate ones were a shock for him. And I suspect that these are going to be a shock for me as well, because yeah. we have everything from a single province organic chocolate to a vegan chocolate. And... 75% uh, Forstero cocoa from Brazil. Where do you think we ought to start here? Well, you like dairy milk, don't you? So you want a milk chocolate to start with. So we have this milk, uh, Duffy's Milk Corazon del Ecuador, 43%. Should so we start with here? Yep, so that's only got 43% cocoa, and then it'll have some milk powder and some sugar. And they're a company in England. And they buy in their beans. They have bought the beans directly from that same farm in Ecuador. So what you do when you're having when you're having expensive chocolate, it's like the difference between having a shot of really bad rum or I was the teenage to well, you know, we could drink when we were over eighteen. So me and Cubs in 18, at eighteen, I used to have flaming Zambucas. I do not know if anybody knows what they were. If you are over the age of 25, you should not be drinking flaming Zambucas. They are as bad as they sound. So so what you have to do is is when you're having this, it, it just imagine dairy milk and imagine you would normally just open up our dairy milk and shove it in your mouth. What you want to do is break this chocolate by your ear and you should hear that it's got a good snap. Yep. And then what you should do, want to put a tiny bit in your mouth, don't put a big bit in your mouth, and then just let it melt. Hmm. And you should see what kind of flavors that you're getting in that chocolate. If you want to show people the flavor ways, uh, Cocoa Runners developed with a wine, uh, a wine expert and a, a philosopher who really who does a lot of flavor and taste. They developed this chocolate tasting wave so that you could see, see the difference between one chocolate and another. What you get with um, it's kind of similar to tasting whiskey, to be honest. So you get like what the texture is and the melt and then what the taste and the flavor is and then what the aftertaste is, which in a lot of ways is just is really similar to drinking whiskey. But you can see from, from the list of flavors, um, list of textures, what kind of texture you're getting in, in that, Mark. I'm getting a combination of creamy and waxy in this mm -hmm. one, I think. And then step two, moving to the taste and flavor. I'm going to need another bite here. But um, I, I got to admit, it, to me, it was sort of uh, a combination of sweet and uh, almost malty in a way, mm -hmm. just looking off this chart. Um, I am not a foodie by any stretch of the imagination, as my family will tell you. No, but if and, you like whiskey, if whiskey people know about flavor, this is one of... This is, I think, to me, one of the issues about the kind of Anglo-Saxon world is how much we've separated drink and food. That actually, it's really interesting if you do, because I'm, I'm, I'm mostly, I kind of got into whiskey through food, through knowing about food. If you give a whiskey tasting to people who know about food, they say different things than whiskey people, but they still really pay attention to the flavour. They might... They don't generally like such extreme flavors as maybe whiskey drinkers do, but they still know about flavor. And there is no way that you don't know about flavor if you know about whiskey. Absolutely no way. It's just it's just changing your language slightly, but you can tell the difference between one chocolate and another in the same way oh, you just concentrate, same way you can tell the difference between one whiskey and another. And this is my first experience with really good milk chocolate. Uh, I would say, and I want to go back to show this chart again, 
-hmm. that it's obviously sweet. Um, there's no salt in this one. No. Um, no smokiness at all. Almost maybe a little bit of floral character to it. And then the aftertaste is just really nice and well balanced. Um, there's a little bit of honey to it. Um, a slight bitterness, but I would rate this one as either good or very good. Good. It's a, I mean, Duffy's, is a, Duffy's is a really well-respected maker. They're a really good um, whiskey maker. So if you, I want, so what whiskey are you going to start off with trying this one? Well, I had a glass of Aberfeldy 12 poured, and that doesn't go well at all. Why not? With this one. Because the Aberfeldy 12 is rather sweet, very floral, very light, and I don't think it complements. Basically, it's overdoing the same flavors as the chocolate. Um, I'm looking at the taste profile on the packaging, and this one has listed as floral chocolate with hints of hazelnuts, orange blossom, and allspice. And those are a lot of the same flavors I get in the Aberfeldy 12, so they don't really complement each other. That is the massive key, I think, to tasting whiskey and chocolate. The very first time I did a whiskey and chocolate tasting on, informally, I was in the Potsdale pub in Glasgow and I had some friends that like whiskey and like chocolate and they just, I, we, I think we had, and I think it was, it wasn't an Aberfeldy, but it was a kind of soft, kind of space side sort of whiskey from, from up there. And we tried that with some, just some really good quality milk chocolate. And they all sat there going, no, this, this doesn't work. But what I'd I like want to, to do, go ahead. if you try it, try it. Have you got, what are you going to try? Because I was going to say something like a Brulade or a, even a Port Charlotte, but maybe a Brulade. I've got a Scarabus, which is uh, from w one of the milder Isla distilleries. Right. Uh, Hunter Lang does not say which one it comes from. I suspect Bunahaven, but I could be wrong about that. And they've mm -hmm. never confirmed it, obviously, but... That would be one of the lighter Isla ones. So let me try it with a sip so of try this the now. lighter Isla and see, and see what you think. And when you say that it goes, tell me what you think is happening in your mouth. Okay, a little whiskey first, and now the chocolate. Mmm. Putting up some of our comments here while we're talking. Yeah, Dave, uh, high cocoa tent dark chocolate. I think the thing about high cocoa tent dark chocolate I've really noticed with craft chocolate is because it has so much better quality cocoa and it's been ground so much better. The tastes are really different. So there's 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 a few different different cocoa runners has quite a lot of um chocolates that maybe have the same percentage. So you have like 80% that's just chocolate and, and then 20% sugar. And you can get a range of 80% and they have really different tastes because the bean's different, the company making it's different. So that they'll grind the bean differently. They'll temper the chocolate differently. They'll just do something slightly different in their processing. In that respect, it's quite like whiskey because in the end with whiskey, you know, especially with Scotch malt whiskey is you're having, you're having an, a, 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 a drink that's just malt water and yeast malted barley water and yeast nothing else and if you go from a lafroig to a, a balvenie they're a totally different taste you don't get that that bigger that huge bigger range of, of flavors if you had a load of 80 percent or 70 percent chocolate um, from cocoa runners but you do you do get really really different flavors and tastes which again i think is something that whiskey drinkers should be really interested in especially if it doesn't break your bank well you dave Q has go ahead no, Dave is saying about a chocolate that had some sea salt in it would complement a brew laddie Isla Barley. Well, actually, we are doing a tasting at the Isla Festival with some brew laddie Isla Barley. We're doing a tasting at their distillery, and we're actually using some chocolate called Om Nom Nom from Iceland. It's an Icelandic maker, and they've also put some black barley in one of their chocolates that we're probably going to use at the tasting. Well, let's... We Try out Dave's hypothesis here and see what happens because I do happen to have the uh, 2011 Brooklady Isla Barley. And you have, um, and you've got a Manicow, you've got a Manicow Manico. chocolate. What percentage is that Manicow one? 63%. That's with the uh, cocoa that. nibs and sea salt. 
so what you do with that is you get the, you'll get some texture in that in in the manicow because the cocoa nibs are just fermented beans that the they dry and ferment them and they kind of ground them into the chocolate so you get a so you get a different texture some people absolutely love that love that contrast some people don't like it it's a really personal taste and with a little bit of salt i think it might work well with the brew laddie the thing i find with brew laddie i my issue i had with the laddie was that i did one spend an evening and I ended up just about finishing a quarter of a bottle because i tried about 20 different chocolates and none of them went because i needed a milk chocolate a kind of milk chocolate with some kind of caramel notes went with brew laddie nothing dark couldn't find anything dark to go with it that day at all oh this has a snap to it you see this is not it, dairy milk at all nope. mark is it, it but Let's see if you can hear this. I, I don't know if you can hear the snap or not on the microphone. Yeah, but let's try out Dave's hypothesis, uh, the sea salt uh, cocoa nibs. And the one thing I'm noticing on these that I don't see on generic chocolate bars is an expiration date. Chocolate does go bad, doesn't it? I think it's more... I think it's more they just have to put one to be honest i think because because it doesn't have so many preservatives and so much frankly rubbish in it, it it has really good quality ingredients they don't last forever you know i mean in, in the same way that i suppose if you opened a cheap bottle of wine it kind of lasts longer than if you open a really good bottle of wine because it's got stuff in it that'll keep that'll keep it going in a way that really good quality wine doesn't in that respect, once you know, once you've opened a, a, a bar of chocolate, you kind of should finish it within about two weeks. It's not like a bottle of whiskey that you can open it and leave it. Mm. So, so what do you think of that Menaco? So the difference with that one as well is the Duffy, the bean came from Ecuador and in Menaco, it's a, a maker in Madagascar and all of their beans come from Madagascar. And you can taste the difference between the two. Obviously, the, the darkness mm -hmm. on this is. Oh, the aftertaste with the uh, whiskey and the chocolate. With the aftertaste of the finish of the whiskey really works well with the chocolate. So what do you think it does? What what, what do you notice? D does it bring out any other notes in the brew, Laddie, that you've not noticed before? It brings out a little bit of the peatiness, I think, that you don't normally mm -hmm. get. Some heather. The sea salt brings out more of the brine in the brook, Laddie. In the Isle of Barley. Mm -hmm. The texture on this chocolate is fantastic. It's a Menaco are a really good chocolate maker. They're lovely. They're really good chocolate. And um, the thing, the thing that you, what you're talking about now for me is when a whiskey and a chocolate go really well together. It makes it brings out. It brings out different notes in the chocolate. It brings out different notes in the whiskey. And the interesting thing about pairing is sometimes it's meh, like you got with the Duffy's chocolate and the Aberfeldy, that they just didn't they didn't go together, even though it's a really good chocolate and a really good whiskey. And sometimes it can just make the whiskey almost taste like it's burned oak. It brings out so much of the charring from the oak that it just tastes burned. I mean, I, I did once at a chocolate fair I was trying, we were doing an event and I was going around the, the chocolate makers with some whiskey saying, okay, we need to get some whiskey that matches. I need to get some chocolate that matches with my whiskey. And they would give me something that I knew wouldn't work. And I'm going, okay, try this. And then they would, they would give, um, then they would, they would try their chocolate and their whiskey. And they would go, they so they would try their chocolate and my whiskey and they go, this is not good. Like this is, my chocolate's horrible. I can't believe this. I said, okay, just try this chocolate. I think it'll go better. Then when they when they tried it, they like, I didn't even know those notes were in my chocolate. I didn't. I really didn't get. Didn't didn't ever appreciate quite that level of flavour in my own chocolate. So that's what you're looking for. You're looking for the whiskey to be better and the chocolate to be better, and that's a that's a good match. How our friend chocolate? Chris, our friend Chris Ratcliffe wants to know when tasting chocolate, how do you engage your sense of smell? Uh, the tasting wave we discussed earlier doesn't really account for smell in there does it well the thing with the tasting is 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 if you if you if you put the chocolate in your mouth and, and hold your nose you don't you don't taste very much what you're noticing is a kind of rate is the, the retronasal nasal off action with chocolate you're not getting i mean if you started if you melted it in your hand you would get a much stronger smell but really what you're getting is the taste 
and, and the kind of retro nasal, so that the, the taste you get at the back, once you have it in your mouth and it's starting to melt, that's that's when you really get the flavour. So that would be when you get, get the flavour and then that's when you mix it with the whiskey. I'm trying this uh, again by itself without the whiskey and the texture on the bottom of the bar from the uh, cocoa nibs is just sort of a nice rough texture to it, but the chocolate itself is uh, very rich and luscious and uh, very sweet um, with just that little bit of sea salt and uh, almost a vegetative, a vegetation, a vegetal note to it. The thing is, genuinely craft chocolate is a different ball game. It's a different ball game from Hertie's. And yes, the man, Mr. Hertie must be spinning in his grave and now seeing what, what kind of things are happening to his chocolate and also, you know, seeing the good that the craft industry is doing. It, it, it really, it really goes, the thing about it really going well is you can get really into different chocolate, like you're saying about, you know, the, the nibs. You might, it turns out you are a person that really likes chocolate with nibs. So you can end up sitting there going through different chocolate with nibs and finding which one's your favorite and what kind of different textures you have with chocolate. Some people don't like nibs in their chocolate at all. They, they, they just prefer the pure texture of the chocolate. There's so much, I just think, I, I do think it's like whiskey. There's something for everybody in craft chocolate that you will find things that you like that you didn't expect. And also it's that nuance, you know, it's the, it's the, see the difference even in the texture of the chocolate of the Menaka, the way they make it compared to the texture of Duffy's and just how those things are, how those things really, really to me complement whiskey in general, because it's very, it's a very similar language. It's that sort of nuance of small differences. We have a, another question from Chris Ratcliffe. Is dark chocolate like the peated whiskey of the chocolate world? Do people find it divisive? Actually, in craft chocolate, what people find divisive, divisive is white chocolate because it's made from cocoa butter and not the beans. That's the thing that is, that is, um, that's really the controversial thing in, in craft chocolate. But the thing about craft chocolate is it's so small that people haven't really had a chance to fight yet. You know, it's a really, it's one of those really small industries where everybody's still really nice to each other. So nobody's having big controversies because they all, they follow the same rules of buying in the beans, doing minimum processes and selling the chocolate that at the moment there's not been a big fight yet. Dark chocolate and cherry whiskey is often delicious. And there was somebody before who just said about the whiskey, about having Lagavulin 16 and a uh, dark salt. Yeah, that, that brother. smoked smoked salted dark chocolate so we have a kind of sort of almost smoked chocolate um for you to try mark it's a it's a chocolate called solomon solomon's gold and this one? they are they are a, a chocolate maker from new zealand and what they do is they, the beans that they buy and are all from papua new guinea but the problem in papua new guinea is it's very very humid so before, before the farmers can dry the beans, they actually have to kind of dry them quite near fires because it's too humid for the beans to dry. So the chocolate isn't smoked and the bean isn't smoked, but it tastes slightly smoked. And you'll see it's only 7% uh, more chocolate than the Menacao that you had, but it tastes completely different and the texture is completely different. It doesn't have any fruity flavours in it. It just... I mean, I love it, but it's just, it's really different to the first two that you tried. I don't know if you can hear that snap as I was pulling you like the that piece snap, out. Don't you? That snap is nice. I like that. I'm going to have to start listening for that more often. We'll put that back. So this is Solomon's Gold, 70% cocoa, organic artisan chocolate. And... Mmm... Um, Now try that with your Aberfeldy. This is nice and right before I taste the Aberfeldy. There's a subtle smokiness to this. I get the smokiness mm -hmm. on there, but the texture is very creamy. It's it's not you know, it's not a smoked chocolate, but it mm -hmm. and it, it doesn't have peat the way like a villain has peat. It doesn't have smoke the way liquid or smoke but it's there 
and it doesn't feel like it's an add-on. You don't feel like the you know the bacon milk or the or the melted chocolate and smoked underneath it. Now there's a note of fresh berries that's coming out, like raspberries almost, mm -hmm. that comes out in this one. And what do you think of it with the Aberfeldy? Well, let's try it and find out. Mmm. Yeah, the allspice from the Aberfeldy and the orange blossoms and the notes we get off the Aberfeldy. Um, there's a dog shaking the tripod. <laughs> All this happened. But uh, the, <laughs> the allspice and the orange blossom, the fruitiness of the Aberfeldy and the dried flowers really complements the dark chocolate in this well. Um, that sort of subtle smokiness really sort of plays off of each other. And if you try that now, try that smoked chocolate with with brulee, not brulee, Port Charlotte. If you got or, or if you've got a really peated whiskey. I mean, uh, oh, I've have, got a Port Charlotte, uh, yeah, heavily try peated. With the, try with Port, Port Charlotte, Charlotte, ten year old. And see what you think, because I want you to compare yeah. that to then if we have the white, if you have the white chocolate with the Port Charlotte, and see what you think the difference is. Okay. And which one of these is the white chocolate? Um, it's Zotter. It said the Zotter white chocolate with cocoa. It's There's like a grey bar. It's like the square circle begins with a Z. Is this the vegan one? Yep. I think that's white okay. chocolate with berries. Okay. Be because rather than milk powder, I think they've used coconut milk in, in, the, in the chocolate. Okay. Got it. So let's try this now with the Port Charlotte. Love that Port Charlotte. Doesn't everybody? Do and to those who don't like it, great. Like it. More for us. <laughs> exactly. This actually kind of works. Mm -hmm. Because because the Solomon's Gold isn't incredibly smoky because it's got a smoky touch as opposed to being real full flavoured smoke in your mouth. Between the chocolate selection and the whiskey selection, I really want to be in the room with Mark about now, Matt. <laughs> Matt, so do I. Do you know, I am sitting in Lisbon because I'm at a friend's house and there is no whiskey in my house. And I am drinking Portuguese wine and Portuguese water because there's no whiskey, no chocolate in this house. So would you now try the white chocolate? My wife supposedly doesn't like peated scotch, but apparently she and a lady pharmacist have sconded with Port Charlotte to one corner of the room as their private bottle. Do you know, Bill, my mother says that she doesn't like peated whiskey. And once I had written my book, I wrote about in the book about how she doesn't like peated whiskey. And she told me the reason that she actually doesn't like peated whiskey was about 30 years ago, she was doing, she was in a conference in Inverness and a friend of hers managed to down about half a bottle of Lagavulin each and were very ill the next day and they never neither of them took peated whiskey ever again she can't even smell it over 20 years later because it takes her back to the morning after the Inverness. okay now i i want to clear i want to confirm that this is what i'm supposed to be tasting because no because there's another white is it oh, not one that says it's white no there's not one that says white um there's one that says 50 percent milk chocolate with date sugar Right, and what, what did that other one say? I must have said um, with it's the light the label is in German, but it's uh wild berries and coconut bar with date sugar. 
Ah, that was supposed to be a white one. That's fine. Um, that, if that, but that'll be the lightest one that you have, so try that one. There should have been okay. a white chocolate, but we must have made a mistake oh, in well. delivery. But that's a very light that's a very light chocolate, that a very low percentage of cocoa compared to most of the other ones. This did not have as good a snap to it. No, because good. it doesn't have as, as much cocoa in it. And as Tabitha Spirit Bomb points out, just give me a bottle of PC10 and a straw. <laughs> and yeah, Christopher my wife. I don't uh, think that's such a good idea. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, the berries in this really come out. Mm -hmm. So Zotter's a French company, and he that he started doing Zotter started doing chocolate in 1992. He was one of the very first people to do craft chocolate. I think he kind of what he really wanted to 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 get involved with with cocoa product, with encouraging cocoa production properly, and then making the chocolate himself. So he's been he's one of the first people ever to make craft chocolate. So he. He puts a lot of different things in his chocolate, like date sugar and coconut milk and all kinds of things. So see how that goes, Abru Laddie, because that'll be the kind of sweetest, softest chocolate that you've got. It works pretty well. Um, just a split second here, because I was actually tasting it against the Port Charlotte. Here we go against the Brook Laddie. Let's see what you think. Yeah, I, I get the uh, smokier whiskey. Uh, yeah, it plays right off the berries well. It, pl it mm -hmm. Flavors tend to complement each other really nicely. Um, let's see. What other spirits does chocolate pair well with? Graham Frazier would like to know. He's guessing some dark rums. Or would the dark it, rum it, overpower the chocolate? No, not necessarily. I think it, it depends on the chocolate. It pairs. It does pair really well with dark rums. It pairs really well with, with, with whiskey. It can be hard. It can pair with gin, but it's actually quite a lot of work because you've got to offset the juniper in gin. Um, with vodka, the kind of, you know, the higher upper end vodka you do, you need to have it a much cleaner taste. So it's harder with vodka. It's probably genuinely at its best with whiskey. Although craft chocolate does pair really well with wine. But the thing with wine is that I don't think it pairs that well socially. Very few people think that, you know, very few people think to open a bottle of wine and have some chocolate, whereas more people would, after dinner, more people would think about having whiskey or rum and chocolate after dinner. Also, maybe uh, Armagnac and Cognac, but I, again, the difference between, say, Armagnac and Cognac and whiskey is you don't get the range of flavours in Armagnac and Cognac that you get in whiskey. So there's an element where I think whiskey's the best one to pair it with because whiskey has the widest range of flavours that other spirits just don't have. I think if we brought back chocolate liqueurs, well, actually, Spirit Bomb, we are trying to get what you're saying is I think it would be good if we brought back chocolate liqueurs, but with craft chocolate and amazing whiskey. That is one of the things I'm trying to do. If I can get more whiskey drinkers into really good chocolate, at some point, some of the chocolate makers will realise there's something to be made in making their really good chocolates with, with some really good whiskey. That That is, if, if you would buy more Coco Runners chocolate, we can persuade them to make some, to make some whiskey and, and chocolate. Do we have this cocoa? question from Chris Ratcliffe about uh, do many cocoa growers also make chocolate? And at the other end, do companies buy ready-made blocks of chocolate for processing, blending, etc.? How do the folks who are making these chocolates get their cocoa and then process so it and buy, turn it into so they, chocolate? So they buy, the craft chocolate makers buy beans directly from the farmer. So actually about, if you look at others, about 5% of cocoa grown is grown for craft chocolate makers. 95% is generally grown for big commodity chocolate. And big commodity chocolate makers buy ready-made blocks of chocolate. So a lot of the time they'll just the beans will just be all mixed together from any farm. They don't generally care 
about the quality of the beans. There is also another problem, Chris, which is, um, you know, there's child labour involved. There was a big news article in on Channel 4 in the UK earlier this week about how turns out Cadbury's are, are, are still essentially using child labour for some of their cocoa farms, even though even though they don't they don't realise that, but they don't pay a lot of attention. And a lot of chocolatiers, what they do, or and, and a lot a lot of chocolate makers do as well, is they just buy in bulk chocolate and then they just remelt it. So there's a difference between bean to bar and handmade chocolate. I've seen this with them um, labels. I've started to uh, become a real label freak. It's because when you learn about Scotch. It, Scotch is so so heavily regulated that you 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 as a, as a consumer you know what you're getting when when you know how to read a label you know exactly what you're getting. With chocolate, it can be really really complicated. It's like this is a beautiful handmade chocolate from this village and blah 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 blah. And then you look on the back and it just says, um, you know, handmade chocolate originally from Belgium. So all they've done is just buy in big commodity chocolate, remelted it and packaged it as handmade because essentially they've melted it again and reshaped it. The craft chocolate that you get at Cocoa Runners and all of the all of the chocolate that you're eating today is bean to bar. These people have to buy the beans and they generally well they, they have to know what farm those beans came from because other because they buy them direct. And this idea of, of direct trade is the thing that really makes a difference to the cocoa farmer and to the producer because they know who these people are and they, they, they know where they came from. They know how they grow their cocoa and they give them a guaranteed price. So one of the reasons you pay more for your chocolate is that it is that the, the supply chain, they get more money at the end of the day. It, it makes a massive difference. You've just Vogue hot chocolate smoke and stout caramel bars. Christopher Muller, I have no idea if Vogue hot chocolate smoke and stout caramel bars have are any good or if they make their own chocolate or if they're if they're craft chocolate makers at all. I have no idea. But I'm sure you can tell Mark whether you enjoy them and what you think about them. Yeah, Christopher, let us know what you think when you try those. Um, I suspect if they're being sold on Amazon, it's probably not craft chocolate. But uh... you know, you never know. They're just—they're not a company that they're not a company that I know. I mean, these generally speaking, a lot of craft chocolate makers start off um, with in their kitchen with with lentil grinders because they start off with kitchen processors. But the problem is to grind. To grind up a bean takes can take anything up to like sixty hours, depending on how smooth you want the you want the the ground to be, and your kitchen processor will explode if you put it in for that length of time. And somebody discovered that Indian lentil grinders were the thing that they go they can go on forever. So they were the, the thing that everybody when they start off small they use before they then maybe buy their own stone grinders or or when they've got a slightly bigger company. But none of these companies are very are very big. I mean, I think that to me, that's where chocolate went wrong. Is it became such a big, a big commodity, in a way that even whiskey, when it's owned by big international companies, it's still made the same way. You know, there's nothing more or less artisanal than than a Diageo distillery than a non Diageo distillery. The whiskey's still made in the same way, and you can go from a really big whiskey company to a really small distillery. You know, if you look at somebody like Simon Erlanger that worked for years at, at Glenmorangie, when they opened up the Harris distillery to do the Herath whiskey, they asked him to come on board. Nobody's leaving Hershey's or Cadbury's to go and, and start doing craft chocolate. Nobody. You know, you, the people, if you see in craft chocolate, they're chefs or the people who are interested in flavour. They've never they've never been a big person. They've never been a big important person in, in Nestle or, or at Hershey's. Which you know, it's a shame because it it it, it kind of it, it's made chocolate this really cheap, nasty commodity when it it didn't need to be. Dave Kuhn says he gets some uh, big dark chocolate notes in Glen Allocky Twelve. Let's draw on your whiskey experience for a bit now. Uh, what would give us uh, dark chocolate notes in a whiskey? Is it the wood? Is it the barley? Uh, what's the combination that gives us those uh, dark chocolate notes? I would think those those cocoa notes will come from the wood in the same way that the you know we sometimes when you get a slight coconut note that's also from the wood. I think any kind of cocoa notes will be will be from the wood because it wouldn't make sense for it to come from the barley. And it might also be although it might be the toast if you get that kind of toast that kind of toast that could almost be cocoa that kind of 
ro real roast flavour, that might also, it might be the barley, but I would say 90% that it would be the wood most of the time. And Chris Ratcliffe wants to know what new trends are getting you excited in the chocolate world? I think more people just being aware. I think really more people being aware. And and I find their similarity, how, how the chocolate makers get really geeked out about what, about chocolate the way whiskey people do, I find really interesting. You know, there's a guy, um, Fries Holm, who's based in Denmark, and he gets obsessed with like second fermentations and he gets really obsessed with the DNA of a cocoa of a cocoa bean in the same way that, that you know, you know, like when you're all at festivals, if you're at Space Island or you're at Isla and you're all, all the whiskey people are all in a crowd and they're all talking about fermentation and yeast and what's going on and what, what barrel and what, oh, they like the 12 year old of this one. Oh, have you tried this cask finish? Have you tried that one? Oh, I don't like cask finishes and those debates go on all night. Well, the thing that gets me excited is seeing chocolate makers do exactly the same thing all together in one room about chocolate. It is really, it's, it's brilliant. It's really, really, really entertaining to watch. And, you know, I think it's the kind of thing that if you like whiskey, you, you would like craft chocolate people. They're basically our people. A lot of similarities between them, especially on mm -hmm. when you look at the chart like this, like the uh, the flavor chart, flavor wave. Mm -hmm. the flavor wave, this looks almost, you could turn a, easily turn a flavor wheel into something like this for scotch whiskey. Well, we're going to because we're doing some events at the Speyside Whiskey Festival and what we're going to do, we're doing them with Barry Smith, who is a professor at UCL and he is a professor of philosophy and taste and he's very interested in how people experience taste. So we're doing whiskey and chocolate um, tastings, but we're not doing the prescribed, we're not going to say this chocolate goes with this whiskey, what we're going to do is try and get people to write sort of mark down and write down and explain how they taste the chocolate, how they taste the whiskey, and then how they taste them both combined so that we can have a much better idea of what people experience with them both together for, you know, for things that match and things that don't and why they match and why they don't and why some people think they do, why some people think they don't. Um, that's that's what we're trying to do, just kind of put it all together to see exactly what happens. Now, the thing I think, again, with the difference between craft chocolate and 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 a Hershey's bar or a dairy milk is you get that aftertaste, you get you get that nuance. I do have to tell you now that you've probably had about six different craft chocolates, you will really notice when you have a, a normal bar, you'll be like, this is just pure sugar. This is, I'm, I'm really, I, I actually get quite upset now because so many chocolatiers just use bulk buy and chocolate to, to make their chocolate truffles. And so they make this really beautiful truffle with a beautiful filling but this, the cover is just really naff chocolate. And somebody, I was, this was about three months after I started doing some work with Cocoa Runners, and somebody that I know was in her house, and it was her birthday, and her husband had given her these amazing um, sort of French truffles. And I tried one. I was like, oh, this is amazing. I love this chocolate. I know how expensive it is. Oh, you're so lucky to have one. And I tried it, and it was awful. It was really terrible because the chocolate had no taste it had no aftertaste it just was sugar it just felt like it was just sugar and cheap cocoa solids and i sent a message to spencer who runs coke runners i was like i hate you i can't i don't like this chocolate anymore <laughs> he just sent me a message going welcome to our world that's what it's like and you know but at the same time it does open open a, it opens an entire world of, of of straightforward chocolate the way that it should have been and the way that whiskey is we have a question from Dave Kuhn, who you've referred to chocolatiers as the folks who make the chocolate, but is there a name for a chocolate expert the way wine experts are called sommeliers, or is the term chocolatier used for them as well? No, chocolatier is for people who make chocolate truffles. So they're so they they buy in bulk chocolate and then they add flavors to them and stuff and 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 maybe like stuff them with things. If you've got like a ganache, or if you've got like a Turkish delight, or you know, some people you get lime chocolate truffles. So that's a chocolatier. There isn't a word for a chocolate expert, as far as I know. But then is there a, is there a big word for a whiskey expert? Like a sommelier? A nerd. <laughs> well, chocolate geek then. We would be chocolate geek pretty much. Craft chocolate geek would be the one. And often, and as opposed to whiskey, they, they have tend to, they don't all have beards. 
There's probably, a, in, in terms of the beard ratio, I think there's more whiskey nerds with beards than there are chocolate nerds with beards. <laughs> now, Tabitha Spirit Bomb wants to know what you thought of the Japanese Kit Kat chocolate bar that was aged in Laphroaig barrels for six months. First word that comes to my mind is gimmick, but... Not a lot. Would be the best. Would be the best way to put it. Would be not an awful lot. I mean, it's it's it, it's one of those things that people do because it it brings in publicity. You know, they're 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 really they're they're a big company. Kit Kat. It gets them talked about in Japan. I don't think it, I don't think it's a bad idea if you know what they're doing. I mean, you know, if if they if they did work with a really small craft company, it doesn't bring them a lot of publicity. <laughs> But do work with a whiskey brand that's popular in Japan. It'll get them all the publicity in the world. Exactly. I mean, and, and, you know, you got to do what you got to do. You resemble up here to Mark. Oh, Bill, believe me, I spend a lot of time in the pot still in Glasgow and in the Bon Accord in Glasgow. I, I know my beards. <laughs> and Dave said uh, the Bowmore 15 has a lot of chocolate notes, and that's what he was trying to think of. And that's the one I remember – Years ago at a party, doing getting people to try the Bowmore with a bite of dark chocolate, mm -hmm. and people going, "Wow, I never thought that you could pair whiskey and chocolate at the time." And then I sort of fell away from it. But uh, well, you imagine the Bowmore Fifteen with every single chocolate that you've tried, and you can Im imagine the difference that, that how what different flavor notes you'd get in that Bowmore chocolate with every single chocolate that you've just tried today. And how, how that would make the taste of the bowl more change. And Chris Ratcliffe, one of his favorite chocolates is the co-op dark chocolate with orange oil. Is flavored a chocolate an interesting category and an abomination under the nib, the way that uh, flavored whiskeys are an abomination no, to the whiskey uh, connoisseur? No, some of some of the whiskey com some of the chocolate com uh, companies do some of the craft chocolate companies do make a flavored chocolate. Like they have, um, you know, the one you just tried, the, the Zotter, they put some berries in. They um, also, I think Atkinson's who who get, who get run a co-op in Madagascar, uh, Bert Atkinson, he, he quite often flavors his chocolate with, with spices that are growing around the cocoa farm. So he has one, he has a, a I think it's a white chocolate with, with red, with rosy pepper. Um, the Atkinson's chocolate that you have is a Brazil is a Brazil is a Brazilian uh, cocoa whipped from a farm in Bahia in the northeast. Yep. So Atkinson's was again was one of the one of the big kind of he was kind of almost like the Johnny Walker of of or the Alexander Walker of chocolate. And his father was a diplomat in Madagascar, so he decided that cocoa farming had to get itself into a better state. So he. Uh, started a cocoa farm there and then started making his own chocolate and now he also they also have a help run a co-op in in northern brazil so that chocolate 75 percent so again it's just that if you compare that to the solomon's gold they're they're very very similar ingredients but quite different tastes probably actually let's, they've got the same ingredients but quite different tastes so let's take a little nibble of this one and this is the Atkinsons. Mm. So I like that. I don't mind that co-op chocolate with orange oil. If I've not had chocolate for a few days and I have that co-op chocolate with the orange oil, I quite like it until I then have a craft chocolate and I then realise why craft chocolate's much better than the co-op chocolate with orange oil. But for example, the Mena cow that you, you had earlier, the Mena cow has got quite strong berry notes in it and that's just from the cocoa there's no addition to that at all and what do you think i would like Atkinson's? to i like it i want to try this one with a bourbon mm -hmm. with the uh, baker's i've got the baker's single barrel seven year old this one is at uh, 53 and a half percent abv while i'm trying this um Graham Frazier says he enjoyed your book. Do you have any new titles lined up that you're working on? I am at the moment trying to write a novel in Portugal without much success. This is why um, 
um, in Lisbon right just just now. I had pitched to do a very similar book to Chasing the Dram, but going around Ireland, but I was unsuccessful in my pitch. No, no publisher wanted it. So I am at the moment trying to finish a novel and I'm about three years too late. So don't ask me how that's going, Graham, because <laughs> it, to be fair, in the past few months, it's a lot better than it has been. But um, a lot of people I know because of COVID are actually very late with their books, so I don't feel so bad. Ah, you tried 100% cocoa chocolate from Hotel Chocolate Spirit Bomb. Well, there is 100% day. Mark does have a hundred percent chocolate there with him that he can try and see what he thinks. So that is Connexions. That is a woman called Jennifer, and I can't remember her surname. She is an American Ecuadorian and she moved back to Ecuador. And what she's trying to do is make cocoa farming for a lot of farmers in Ecuador viable so that they don't end up leaving their farms and, and moving to the city. And that is that. Connex Jones chocolate is 100% cocoa. There's no other ingredient in it at all apart from cocoa beans. I've and never had a 100% cocoa you before. I either like 100% or you don't. It's quite, it's really different on the mouth because there's no creamy notes. So no this would be the peated whiskey of, uh, peated of chocolates. It is, it is totally the peated whiskey of chocolate because the thing about 100% again is once you get into 100%, they can all taste quite different because of the way they've been, the bean, the way it's been roasted, the way that it's been ground, the way it's been tempered. There is nothing, you know, but it, it's not like other chocolate. It is 100% chocolate. There is nothing that offsets it. And it takes longer to melt in your mouth. By the way, the Akasins worked really well with the bourbon. The spices in the mm -hmm. bourbon played really well off the, uh, off of the chocolate. So let's yeah, give this a would. try. The 100%? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You can feel, not necessarily in a bad way, but you can feel like you're, everything's been sucked out of your cheeks when you've got 100% chocolate in your mouth. You think 100% is the Campbell type of chocolate. That is a good way of putting it. It is probably like the Campbell type. Is it the peated or the Everclear? I don't think it's the Everclear. I'm not sure what Everclear is, Bill, but I think no. And see what you think that goes with. And it goes with the bourbon because the bourbon overpowers the uh, lack of flavor, the lack of creaminess, or the lack of texture. The lack of creaminess. Uh -huh. I mean, I think there is a flavor in a hundred percent. Uh, cocoa, but because it's quite, it's bitter. It it takes quite a lot of getting used to. It is in that respect yeah. like a peated whiskey, and that if you've never had peated whiskey before, until you get used to it, it's all you taste. Hundred percent chocolate can be like that. You have to have tried a few, and you know so you've got a reasonable size bar there. If you have a bit, and then have a bit of whiskey, and have a you know the next few weeks, you can you could you'll start to feel more notes in it. It's not it's not a kind of great beginner's chocolate. No, it's, it, it reminds me almost of baking chocolate. Slightly, uh, I can see. I can see what you mean because it's not so sweet, because it you because know, it's got yeah. no added sugar at all. Let's see, uh, Dave Kuhn says he has a set of little Anton Berg chocolate bottles with the famous Grouse and Jim Beam and other things inside. And they make a set with all the Diageo whiskeys in it. Tempted to order that after this live session. To be honest, Dave, you're really better um, getting better chocolate and just doing it yourself. Because you can, you know, you'd be better having chocolate and whiskey yourself than 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 kind of having someone else's not necessarily brilliant brilliant whiskey. Not sorry, having someone's not necessarily brilliant chocolate with with whiskey. Get get your own chocolate. Get your own craft chocolate and have it with whiskey that you like. And it also then means you can have one whiskey and four chocolates, and it gives you much more taste. In a way that if you've got one chocolate liqueur, you've got the chocolate they make you have, and the whiskey inside. Well, this has been a lot of fun. Um, I'm really glad you enjoyed yourself. I had a lot of fun tasting these chocolates. Thank you for sending them over, and uh, thank you for doing this, Rachel. I really appreciate the time today. 
Uh, folks, thanks for uh, watching the Happy Hour Live webcast from Whiskey Cast. Don't forget to join us for the podcast coming out later this weekend. And we will be back next Friday afternoon, 5 p.m. New York time, with another edition of the Happy Hour Live webcast. Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.